So it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. I love Hopkins, and so I really enjoy the opportunity to come here and talk with all the great people who are here and uh, uh, hopefully get some interesting feedback. I've already had some good conversations this morning, so I look forward to talking with more of you. Um, the work I'm going to talk about today has nothing to do with the uh, Alexa Challenge. Uh, this is work that's been uh, uh, mostly by my grad student, uh, Aaron Jake, uh, but it's a problem that I've been uh, grappling with for quite a long time, most of my cre uh, career, and this is this issue of how do we make language models context aware. Um, so I don't think I need to explain language models to this audience, but on the off chance we have some uh, guests who aren't uh, so familiar, um, a language model is used to characterize a, sequ a word sequence, um, it could be a character sequence, so basically any symbolic sequence. Uh, we can use a chain rule to represent the probability of a sequence in terms of the products of each word given its history. And it has many applications. Um, it's used in speech uh, recognition, translation, text generation, language ide identification, uh, search query suggestion, and various other things. Um, but what I'm particularly interested in is language adaptation. So um, language use is highly context dependent. So the words that we choose to say depend on the task you're trying to accomplish, um, where you are geographically, your style, what language you speak. Um, and so the point of this talk is that language models need to be adaptive to all these different contexts. We cannot, the current operating mode for the most part is you build a language model for the domain that you want and then when you go to another uh, domain you build a new language model. And that doesn't scale. Um, so just to give you an illustration, um, <laughs> these are old examples. Uh, the, the first one is Wall Street Journal. So <laughs> an example in this case uh, in a Wall Street Journal um, sentence, this is one sentence. So uh, in newspapers, sentences can be very long. Um, the next example is a blog post. This is actually an old one. It has nothing to do with current politics, though it could very well have. Um, uh, this is illustrating that, again, written speech, people can write more things, longer sentences, but there's a degree of informality to it that you would not generally see in the Wall Street Journal. Um, here's a switchboard example. Uh, the sentences are short, they're informal, they'll be disfluent, uh, they have asides. And then here is um, an actual smartphone example. It's something that I say frequently <laughs> when I'm trying to deal with traffic coming from downtown. OK, Google, navigate me home. So that's a very different type of sentence than you might see in other contexts. And what's the impact of these, dis these uh, style mismatches? And particularly thinking about recognition, because that's what I've been doing. But it, it impacts every, pa every aspect of language processing. Um, early in the 90s, Ronnie Rosenfeld was <laughs> showed that, found that if you train a model on the associate, Associated Press, it's practically useless. The text from the Associated Press is practically useless for uh, Wall Street Journal articles at that time. Um, the vocab and he looked at vocabulary selection and found that you really should ignore old data, that the stuff that matters is new data. In my own work, I focus more on spontaneous speech. And uh, we found in very early work that talk show transcripts are more useful than Wall Street Journal for, for switchboard conversational speech. There's kind of, that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, switchboard, uh, but, but the Wall Street Journal was, was not very useful. If you look at that early example, you can see why. It's totally different. Um, and switchboard is more useful than Wall Street Journal than le lectures. Now, you would not think that switchboard with that informal kind of mindless chat is useful for lectures, but in fact it is because people do not speak in big long sentences in lectures. They, they do, they get disfluent as I will, as I just did, um, and uh, various other sorts of things come out in lectures. 
in low resource languages, we did some, we were doing some work on Turkish and we thought, okay, we'll use broadcast uh, news for this conversational speech. Eh, was useless, absolutely useless, but Twitter text helps. It's informal. Um, in industry, most recently this year, uh, this is my one Alexa Prize comment, um, speech recognition is not yet solved and particularly a recognition system tuned for uh, Alexa, play music from mental as anything, is not going to work for conversational speech that you had with a social bot in the Alexa Prize. The error rate is much higher than you would expect for something that's tuned for dealing with music and kitchen timers and things like that. Um, and when they changed the, uh, the language model, updated the language model, error rate was reduced by a third. That's a pretty big number. Okay, now all of this is saying, okay, I've got this style, I've got speech, and I've got text, I've got formal and informal. It's not so simple, and if you take anything away from this talk, it's that you can't say there's a general domain. Wikipedia, GigaWord, that's not the general domain of language. Everything you have has different factors affecting it. Here's an example of Supreme Court uh, text, and this was from an old language model, it's not our new one, though we have run the new one on it. Um, and just illustrating, we had a component for case, the case of the courts, this was about uh, some teaching thing, so you get teacher and grades and classes. Uh, you have the fact that this is an oral, oral argument, that's the genre of this particular thing. Um, we have separate factors for justices versus advocates. A justice would say, in your view. And we have separate factors for, mo for um, individual speakers. So Breyer, as it turns out, says all right a lot. So all of these factors work together to create the language that we say or that we write. So what are we going to do about it? So here are my key takeaways. Um, context embeddings, the first thing is we're going to use context embeddings because we've got all these factors and it's not like we have, I just gave you three or four factors. This can be very highly dimensional. We, we are we're going to deal with things of thousands of factors. Okay, um, so we're going to use context embeddings to deal with these factors and we're going to adapt neural nets in a, in a new way. Instead of just adding a bias term, we're going to transform the recurrent weight ma matrix, so the whole weight ma matrix. And then lastly, we're gonna, um, I'm going to argue at the very end that we want to look at more than perplexity, that we want to look at text classification. And um, I get a lot of people giving me, giving it in, you know, we got some hard time about this in terms of uh, the paper review, but text classification, you might not be able to do as good as a discriminative model, but it's very informative. And um, before the acoustic modeling people fall asleep, let me just tell you, this is a general result for uh, LSTMs. So this will work in, this should work, we've only done it in language modeling, but this could work in um, multiple applications because it's really just a mathematical way of updating LSTMs. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna just do a little bit more context setting to constrain what I mean by context. Um, uh, then I'm gonna give you the algorithm for low rank adaptation talk about three ways that we tested it, and then some open problems. So going on to the context. So um, people talk about language, when they, people talk about language model adaptation, there's different things that they mean, so I want to explain what I mean. So um, early things people did is domain adaptation. You get a bunch of data, let's say you've got GigaWord, or Wikipedia, or whatever, and you're gonna say, okay, this is my general model, and now I have my other little models, little tasks, target tasks, I got a small amount of data, and I wanna adapt this big model to that target task. Okay, that's not what we're doing. Um, uh, because I think, I don't like the idea that the, the general model is truth, okay? To me, GigaWord is not truth. Um, then another thing to do is training data augmentation. So I have my model, that my data that I, my target data, 
And I know that there's no general model, so I'm just going to go out and look for other data like this. I've done a lot of work on that, and I think it's an interesting problem, but that's not what I'm doing either. Okay? What we're doing now is saying, okay, language is described by all these different factors, and we're going to account for those factors. We're going to pull together data from different sources, and we're going to account for those different factors. So things are going to share what they can share, and have correction terms for the things that are different. Is the vector of metadata features going to be headhunted or alerted? Well, let me get there in two, in two slides. OK? So one of the things that, ha that people have done in the past is uh, a, a form of context is cache language models. So you say the things that, you know, so the probability of topic words is really bursty. And if you've seen something once, then you're in this topic and you've probably seen it, uh, you'll probably see it again. Uh, there's a classic work by Ken Church, the chance of two Noriegas is closer to P over two than P squared. Um, and you can see this if you do statistics. So this is statistics in uh, Reddit. We've done a huge amount of work with Reddit. It's pretty fun data. Uh, and uh, let's see. One of these is Black Friday, and the other is Super Bowl. And you can see that during certain times of year, those words are much more probable than they are in other times of year. And cache models can help with that. The problem is um, you have to get that very low probability word. You have to recognize it. For, you have to actually see it first. So you know, in translation of text, you're probably fine. But with speech, if you haven't seen it as really low probability, you might not catch it in the first place. Then you can't add it to the cache. Now, if you happen to know it's the right time of year, you can change your language model. So. Um, some bursty behavior is predictable, and if you happen to have that information, then you can adapt your language model ahead of time. OK, so what do I mean by uh, I'm going to use known context. What do I mean by that? Any information that can help in predicting this task, um, it could be categorical, it can be numerical, it can be textual, but in some level, it's metadata. And for many problems, you actually know things. So for example, if you're doing a, if you're recording a talk, you have the title and abstract from that talk. Uh, if you're doing a mobile search query, uh, your phone knows where you are generally. It knows the time of day. Um, it, it can assume that it's you. So all that information is known information. If um, you're doing a, a chat bot, okay, you know it's con supposed to be conversational style. Um, you may know something about user personality. If you're doing uh, summarization of reviews for a particular person, you know the person who you're serving it for. You may know that. Okay? Um, and uh, we found, we also did some work on extracting information from uh, electric company repair logs. We know the time of year makes a big difference. Crows cause outages certain times of year. So that's it. Those things are often things that you can know. All right. So um, adaptation has been, you know, uh, as Henick said, this has been, or somebody said, this has been a problem that people have worked on for decades. Uh, as I pointed out, there's people looking at it in the 90s. Um, and, you know, it started out, people did model combination, they did mixture models, they looked at maximum entry model, entropy models. Um, uh, a few of us have looked at log bilinear models and tried to factor parameters as a, to account for these different factors. That was my early work with the Supreme Court data. Um, and then, more recently, people have looked at having context as an added input to a neural network. And so what we're going to do is kind of take this idea and think about context as an input to the neural network. But rather than an input, it's going to control a transformation. And the transformation is going to build on some of these ideas. OK, so here we are. 
Um, so here's our basic vanilla RNN, and we're actually using LSTMs, but the equations, it all, everything works for LSTMs, so I might as well ex just explain it with fewer equations. So I've got, you know, the standard pictures of an RST, uh, RNN, and I've got um, my state update equation, and then it goes to the output, and I do a so soft max, and those are the standard equations. And I'm going to put up the equations because I want you to be able to see what's new. All right, so Mikulov and Zweig introduced this idea of taking a context embedding and concatenating it to the word embedding and sticking everything in. Now, if the context embedding is describing a context, like it's describing the speaker, it's describing that uh, this is conversational speech, most of the content, or a topic, uh, most of the time those context embeddings are constant for the entire time step. It doesn't have to be, but this was the original proposal and most of the work using this has involved that. Okay, so there's two opportunities for adaptation. One is taking that co the concept embedding and giving it to the internal layer, and the other is putting it with the external layer. The, um, so we're going to call that the concat cell, cell model, oops, a typo here, and the soft bias, soft max bias model. So this, this worked pretty well, and lots of people have picked up on stuff like that, and people have done adaptation using, um, sometimes using the concat, concat concat cell, the concatenation part, or lots and lots of people have done the softmax bias part. Um, many uh, contexts, mostly topic, but there's also movie review style, so social media t uh, text, and various other things. So what I want to do now is, is look at that algorithm mathematically, very simple, linear algebra, I just want to explain it in a different way. So what we're going to do is say, um, what I did by concatenating that C is I made my weight ma matrix bigger. Okay, so I could take that weight matrix and factor it into two matrices. So I have my original W plus V times the C, the other matrix times the C. So what I'm doing by inputting that uh, context vector is simply changing the bias term. So I'm doing it in the recurrent layer, so it's affecting the history, but I'm just changing the bias term. So the idea that my student Aaron had is, well, that's not very powerful. How about if we change the W? So that's really the whole idea. So just to do a simple picture in equations, Here's the standard RNN. If I, uh, if I uh, adapt just the output layer, then what I'm doing is adding a term for the softmax equation. If I adapt the recurrent layer by putting in the input, what I'm doing is doing uh, the original paper did both the softmax and updated the H. And so what we're going to do that's different is we're going to use the good stuff that other people have already done, but we're also going to update the W. That's the piece that's new. Um, so how are we going to do that? Because it's a lot of parameters and you, know, you want to worry about how much you can train. So I'm going to explain it first as if there's just a single context, one simple correction term, and what I'm going to do to control the degree of complexity of this simple con correction term is I'm going to make it low rank. So I'm going to add to, here's my generic weight matrix that every single thing in language shares. And then I'm going to add a correction term that's, that's a uh, product of two low rank matrices. And I can change R to be bigger or smaller um, depending on how much data that I have. Okay, so R is going to control the degree of adaptation. Now, what the model really looks like is slightly more complicated because we want to account for the context embedding. So what we have here is our matrices, but now we have a collection of those matrices, so it becomes a tensor. 
and we have our context embedding that, that effectively becomes the weights on those different matrices. So it's like a mixture model. So it's like a mixture of matrices that you're adding as a correction term. So let me, yep. So, so V is now a separate term. We're yeah. making it a separate term. How do you make sure that the, the information that they share is no one, one is not the other one? So, what, so they both have the C term in it. Oops. Okay. So all of this is learned end to end jointly. So you learn the C together with the F and the G and the WC. Okay. And how do you make sure that they don't, you know, they, like they, they learn complementary information, not one is completely, for example, is, if I learn this jointly, if FC is most important than before or less important than before without it? What? So we've done, um, we've done the experiments where we compare this to this to this, so you can see what you get when you add. So, so that's, it's a good question because for some information, um, for some types of problems, this is the most effective way to get it. Okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if you do this jointly, if FC or GC are more important than, than before than now. Oh, um, I think they're less important, but. Okay. Okay, let me explain this um, from a mixture modeling perspective. So early work in language modeling, basically what they did was take separate, mo each domain, each data set is trained separately. You use mixture weights to combine them. And maybe you make those wit mixture weights depend on the history. But it's basically an impoverished way of using the data because you're treating all the sets jo disjointly and you don't have many free parameters. So the alternative is to have mixtures of parameters rather than mixtures of models. And mixtures of parameters allows you to do more sharing across the different data sets because it's trained jointly. So I can have you know, one case, and during this period of time, I'm updating the parameters for the general model, case one, uh, person C and the justice. Then over here, I'm updating parameters from the general model, case two, person B, and the advocates. So I can do all that jointly so that they can share things. And the more factors you have, the more you know that the things in common is actually sharing what's in common. Um, okay, the problem with this model, so this was the log by linear model that we did. The problem is, you know, that I have a separate matrix for each context. If you've got thousands of contexts, it doesn't really scale. And that's where the um, doing the factor cell, which is what we call our model, um, that's where this becomes useful. So instead of having a It's, it's the number of factors, right, so right. There are three cases and six justices and minus these um, So there's, there's the number, yeah, the number of cases. Oh. The, at capital M will be, I'm going to have uh, an AM for the case. Yeah. I'm going to have one for advocate and one for justice. I'm going to have one for each person, okay? So it's a sum, not the problem. It's a sum, yeah. Yeah, but in fact, there's thousands of cases. So it ends up in this particular um, data, we didn't train on all the data, so we didn't have that many cases. But, but in principle, there are thousands of cases, and some of the things that we're going to do, um, we are dealing with thousands of factors. Um, so actually, let's go back. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking 
that sum there, m equals 1 to m, and making it this, this, this sum, this way to the dimensionality of the C is now the proxy for M. Okay. Uh, no more math. I'm just going to give results now. Um, so the, basically, the contribution is the factor model, the factor cell model. Basically, you give it a context that hands you a new W. Okay? It, and it scales to work for hundreds of thousands of different contexts, at least. I mean, uh, so it could potentially scale to more, but that's as far as we've gone so far in the data we've looked at. Um, and since these adapted weights can be pre-computed, you don't, uh, increasing the rank R, so R increases the degrees of freedom, uh, but if you pre-compute, it doesn't increase the cost. And so it's actually exactly as efficient per sample as a normal LSTM. Okay, so I'm going to do a bunch of results. I'm going to kind of zip through them. Uh, the, so you just so you get the basic idea, the main point here, I'm going to start with perplexity because everybody doing language modeling starts there. Um, so I've got six data sets. We've got some word-based language models and some character-based language models. Um, we tried to do things that captured very different types of contexts. So we've got um, uh, four newspaper sections, 14 entity categories for DBpedia, 3,500 hotels plus five sentiment values for TripAdvisor, five sentiment for Yelp, nine languages for Euro Twitter and latitude and longitude. So continuous, so continuous uh, uh, context works just as well as discrete context. Um, so those are the things that we did. Um, so we looked at perplexity, and so this is just doing the soft max bias. This is doing, uh, and this is improving uh, improvements over unadapted. Uh, this is doing just orange is just the concat cell, and yellow is everything. So with each one, we add one more piece. Okay. Um, so in all cases, we win, um, and adding each piece helps progressively more. What's interesting is for uh, Euro Twitter and Geo Twitter, um, you get not so much from the softmax bias because characters, the sequence of characters actually gives you a lot of information um, just on their own. Okay, you can look at, um, to get an idea of what it's learning and the differences between the models, what we did was do, um, what Aaron did, uh, was he did a likelihood ratio of um, the positive sentiment model over the negative sen sentiment model. And so where it's blue, it's something where it's highly positive, and where it's red, it's something where it's negative. And this is the review for, um, that had a positive sentiment overall. And so you can see that the factor cell model is getting a lot more blue, so it's going to be more discriminative or uh, more indicative of the positive, and um, uh, so everything is kind of stronger, but it's got a lot more blue. And it gets things, it's getting the context, not just isolated words. So the softmax bias is going to get isolated words. So 5 to 8 p.m. Ten, seems to be a positive indicator because it's associated with wine receptions, um, but definitely is not a positive indicator unless you're including the re recurrent network and say, I would definitely stay. Um, so as opposed to would definitely never. So that's, um, so it's learning, it's learning context and that's the importance of doing it in the recurrent layer. Um, you can do PCA, so, so we can look at what did we learn in terms of those context vectors. So this is the 3,500 times five. Um, in this particular case, you can, we clustered the, the or sorry, we did a PCA projection of the context embed, uh, embeddings. And you can learn that star ratings, things with the, it didn't have information to star ratings and it didn't have information for um, geolocation. It had just hotel identities and sentiment. And you can see that star rating sort of cluster, 
So um, this is low ratings and this is high ratings. And geographically, they sort of cluster. Um, it, I looked at this and said, how could this make sense? It's like you're learning all the good rest, all the good hotels are in like the East Coast. Um, and it turns out it was a biased sample. So we don't know how much of it is learning. So it does learn words associated with cities. So it definitely does learn those things. And it does learn words associated with star ratings. But part of what the reason why they're the same is that it was a biased sample. The factors, the, the context factors are known things that are specified, so that's supervised. The, the mapping to an embedding is learned. So everything is learned versus standard neural net back propagation, uh, cross entropy loss. Your training data has labeled All factors, right. Factors that you consider. Yeah, everything, we're, so they're known factors and they're all metadata. So we're assuming that we're, this model is working for factors that you know. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, no, no. I'm training and testing on independent data, but you know the same data sources. But this last picture, though, you could have done this on your training data as well, even though I assume you you're showing that test data. Right. Because the training data never saw the star ratings of the geography. Exactly. So you could have done this. Maybe that's why Daniel was confused because this could have been done on the training data. Um, in fact, I think it was done on the dev data. Yeah. Okay. So I do want to get to one thing where I do online updating. So I'm going to try to go through. So the one thing to point out here, um, it turns out that uh, increasing the factor cell rank, so this is perplexity. Everything is tuned on perplexity. Um, so increasing the factor cell rank gives you more mileage um, uh, per LSTM size then um, it, it, so increasing the factor cell rank per compute is more effective than increasing the LSTM size. So both things will help. So if I increase the LSTM size, of course I will do better up to a point. Um, but you'll save money by increasing the rank or save com compute and memory. All right, applications. Um, so we did generative text classification. Query auto-completion and text generation. So uh, the generative text classification was all the same data. Hold out one context as, as unknown and classify it. Uh, query auto-completion is from uh, AOL query log data. And the text was from the, the Yelp review. OK, classification results. Um, it's the same story. We do better with the, um, with the factor cell model for some uh, problems, the softmax bias is, is useless. Um, uh, one of the things that this was useful in trying to understand is what types of context is it good for. So for things that are topic related, we did get a win in perplexity, but not in classification. That was the, the news. So if we have four topics, um, actually topic words, you know, that the softmax bias is just fine, getting the, the unigram frequencies. So when the unigram frequencies are just fine, then, the, then you don't get so much of a win. Unigrams are pretty much useless for um, Euro Twitter, and so the, uh, for Geo Twitter, unigrams was useless, so the, the bigrams are more, the recurrent uh, part is pretty important. Okay, um, the personalized query autocompletion. Here what we did was took um, the idea that people had of using language models to do query completion with and combine that with personalization. So people had done language models and people had done personalization, but they hadn't done both of them. And so we tried to use our model to do personalization where the context is the user ID. Now if you have a new user come along, then what do you do? What we do is we start with a generic user embedding, 
And then we're going to, um, as we get more queries, do online update of just the context embedding. Nothing else in the model, just the context embedding. Okay? And so the test is the language model is going to suggest queries as people type, and we're going to evaluate uh, using mean reciprocal rank. Um, and so what you see is the biggest win is from doing some sort of adaptation, period. Okay, so going from unadapted to the concat cell, we get the biggest win. With our model, the richer model, we get a little win. Now that was with all the data, and in all the data, there's, you don't have tons of queries from people. Some people, you don't have that many queries. So we use people who had just at least 50 queries, um, but when you get more, things get bigger. So if you see here, this is looking at um, cases where you have more data. Okay, so 50 is right around here. There's not a big difference between the models, but as you get more and more data, the bigger the the dis difference gets bigger, and that makes sense because there's more free parameters to play with. So you can Im improve when you have more data. So um, our reviewers wanted us to do some case studies. That's a number. So so you're going to update it each time. So as I see a hundred queries, so. For that user, you're only updating it for the particular user. So is the, is the, is the idea that the factor cell has more parameters that need to be fit compared to the... Um, well, you can, you can adjust the number by the rank. So it has the degree, it has, guess, you can grow it as you get more data. Right, but it, it's tied somewhat to the dimensionality of the R as the LSTM, isn't it? What? Even the minimum rank of one will still leave the number of the parameters. Yes. Yes. Oh, I guess that also has the same thing. No, it's the same thing. So, get a first uh, adapting to the user as you go. Mm -hmm. uh, how would it compare to a, sort of, let's call it a constrained oracle. It's not a real oracle, really, because an oracle, but it's constrained. That you can choose any one of your training users in an oracular way, but keep it fixed. How well would that be? So, I th users are similar enough that there is some user out there who's exactly like this new user, and had you just known that, it would have been better, but maybe not. Kind of yeah, that's actually what I suggested that he do, um, but he did this instead because. Um, when you start with nothing, it's hard to figure out which user, you, how, to, how to do a close, which user to pick. Right, right. No, what I'm thinking is you just try all the users every time. And just oh, I time see what you're saying. You only one, so you can then decide for which one should you have used if you're allowed to Wait, th This is cheaper. This is cheaper. Well, it's cheaper. I'm just thinking that instead of down, you sort of know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Um, Okay, just so the Q to the, we, he actually did a few examples, and this is showing um, the factor cell. Somebody, the, if he types in high school softball and math homework help, um, he's getting things. So this is high school musical, makes sense. This is, I guess, some person that high school kids like. I don't know. And this is some games that high school kids, I don't know, but he told me that. <laughs> um, um, and this one is actually seems to be picking up some orthographic things because you're seeing homes and uh, stuff show up in there. Um, so we also did controllable text generation. Uh, and here, the thing that was easy to um, assess without human experiments was fill in the blank. So we did, this was my first time coming here and the food was blank. And we used the model to generate different words depending on different stars. And what you see here that's different is we get more boundaries between the categories. So we go amazing, great, good, just meh, and awful versus um, delicious, 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 mediocre, mediocre. Okay, so it's providing a little bit more richness. Um, and we actually did some human judgments as well to see uh, in terms of generating things, and, and it works better. Um, you, see a, you see a pretty good difference. 
Um, the thing I wanted to point out with this, what's interesting about this model to me is you could take, so because of the work um, I've been doing in conversational uh, AI, you might want to take text and generate it to be like speech so you can swap a variable in terms of the context. And so um, Aaron played around with uh, generating stuff for Justice Breyer and not, uh, as expected it started out by saying I mean and then uh, he took Kagan as a justice and as an advocate and you can see um, a classic thing a justice would say I don't think that's right and a classic thing an advocate would say is Mr. Chief Justice and may it please the court. Um, so we do learn things about all these factors. Okay. So open problems, um, I just want to, I want to stop in a couple minutes, but I have to make this one point about uh, uh, cla uh, classification. So in generation, what some people are doing is um, evaluate, because it's hard, you've got to do these human experiments. So a quantitative way of doing that is to train a discriminative classifier on the context-dependent text Okay, and then apply that classifier to the text you generated. And if you do better at classifying the text you generate, the argument is it's a better generator. Now, some people don't like that because it seems sort of a circular thing. And so the people who have done this have gotten some criticism. Um, and the other problem that we see is models tuned for perplexity don't always improve text classification. So, so does this really make sense? So here's just an example models we run. Um, Aaron likes to run, write it, run experiments. Um, and so he uses up my whole cluster and tries all kinds of uh, configurations. And you can see that here's perplexity. You increase perplexity. You increase accuracy sort of on a trend, not all the time, um, except for the soft max bias. You're, in this particular case, it's actually not helping. Um, and, but if we run experiments where we classify, do the uh, generation thing, you classify generated text with a discriminative model, that's generation controllability, versus train a classifier, a generative classifier on actual text, and try to classify it you actually get pretty good correlation. And so our, we are thinking um, that actually it's not such a bad thing. And here, when we look at the Yelp things, when I increase the factor cell rank, uh, the controllability goes up, but the perplexity is like <laughs> so. So it's not clear that perplexity, and I'm not saying we should throw perplexity out. Um, it's just not enough. And part of the reason is the interesting things in these models, when you get to these controllable things, the interesting things are infrequent. And that gets washed out by the uninteresting things in perplexity. OK, so basically, um, this leads to uh, problems with how do you train and how do you tune. Um, but ba where I'm going on this, my, where my current thinking is, is we want a multi-objective tuning thinking about both perplexity and classification or something else other than perplexity. So there's also stuff on sparsity, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going to quit. Um, so just in summary, uh, the, the main thing we've done here is introduce this new way of doing adaptation. It's fundamentally different because it's actually changing the weights and not just the bias of the recurrent layer. Um, it gives better performance on a whole variety of data, a variety of contexts, and a variety of applications. Um, and we can do online learning for uh, continuous adaptation. So because RNNs are a fundamental neural network building block, I think there's a lot of other applications that can benefit. In particular, we're interested in natural language understanding and information extraction. Um, but it could be also used for music generation, acoustic modeling, and other types of time series analysis. So just to let you not forget, context embeddings provide a nice way, way to capture context, uh, a big mixture of factors. Um, neural nets can be adapted by, in terms of their weights, 
not just the bias. And text classification is a useful complement to perplexity in model selection. Um, and with that, I will leave you with Aaron and uh, his papers and his code. And take questions. Right. Um, that's a good question, um, and we haven't really looked at it. So I, I guess I can just say thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> uh, are all these uh, one layer artists? Um, yes. So uh, sort of a natural question is whether the distinction between uh, factor cell and uh, concat cell uh, goes away if you add another layer. Um, right, 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 right. Yeah, so I actually think it's an interesting question of what, I think the, the question that I ask myself is what would happen if we do the factor cell at the uh, second layer? Because um, some of the work that people, at least at UW, people are excited about Elmo and uh, the, this idea that having the multiple layers of LSTM is capturing different levels of linguistic information. And so one could imagine you'd want to do different transformations at different layers. So I think that um, just putting it at the input, I mean, even if you were going to just do bias shifts rather than weight shifts, I would not just do it at the input because you could learn other things as, uh, as you go. Well, you could do it at every Right, right. Yes. Yes. You can do it at every level. Right. So, and I think that is an interesting next thing to do. Um, but I think it's, uh, it, I think it would be interesting to look at that in the context of what are you learning at the different layers. Um, so controllability, that's a good, uh, I, hate that, I hate the use of that word because in um, electrical engineering we're not doing controllability. Uh, so this, is, this was a term that was coined by somebody else and we're just borrowing it. It's basically, it's a language model that you can control for different contexts. Uh, so we so we're using something with three gates, and each one is going to have the same thing. So each one gets its own weight transfer. Transfer. Uh, 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 we do three, but yeah. Yeah. So. And each three gets its own one. Yeah. They're three different. Um, yeah. So I don't think he's looked at the. You know, it's a good question. Um, one thing I don't know that he actually explored changing the rank because the way to do that is look at changing the rank in the different gates. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. That would be the experiment to do, but I don't know that he did that. Okay. Um, but that would be that would be an interesting thing to do. <laughs>